Have you ever had one of those vehicles that uh, increases your prayer life? So let me tell you, I, I uh, was privileged several years ago to buy a new-to-me Toyota pickup. And it was a V8 with four-wheel drive, and I just loved that truck. And it was, it was what I really wanted. And it had one small little problem. If you left it sit too long, and I was trying to drive a car that got a little better gas mileage some days, and so I would leave it sitting for several days. And if you left it sit too long, you'd come back and try to start it, and it's like, <laughs> nothing there. Because something was robbing the power. It just kept draining a little bit off. And we, I paid to have it tra- fixed, and we tried to find it. And, and it's frustrating when something is draining your power so that you can't do what you want to do. And I, I thought of that pickup, and I thought sometimes my spiritual life is like that, that the, the power is there and available. And yet, if I am not renewing daily, then it drains off, and pretty quick I can't get a start. And we're going to be talking this weekend about the power of God. And our series is called The Unstoppable, which is talking about God's plan of reaching the nations and, and God's plan for the world. And I know some of you have expressed a little dissonance, like, well, churches get stopped all the time, and I totally agree with you. In fact, the sad statistic is that 80% of the churches in America are either plateaued or declining. And I've watched many churches stop and, and then die. And in fact, family churches come to places where we have stopped many times. And so the church is stoppable individually. But the church of Jesus, the churches that's all over the world, the churches that's through all the ages, that will never be stopped. Jesus said the gates of hell cannot stand against it. And so really our question is how do we get in line with God so that his power and his unstoppability is what we experience in our lives and in our church? And so we've talked about this phrase several times that Pastor Ed introduced in the first message, that the people of God... That's us, and we've talked about the body and the bride of Christ, filled with the Spirit of God. And Pastor Will talked last week about that wonderful infilling of the Spirit and how he, he seals us and builds the fruit of the Spirit in us. And then fueled by the power of God, so that we, we learn how to reach into God's power and live that out in our lives, so that we can accomplish the mission of God. See, all of these three are to come down to that last one, which is, how is God's plan for the world? How is the kingdom of God going forward, even when it looks like it's not? And so this weekend, we are talking about the power of God and what that means. And my goal for you is not only to believe in the power of God and to understand it a little better, but to practice daily being able to put yourself in a place where God's power is in you and you are beginning to see that power worked out around you. And so I want to tell you a story that I love. It's one I've been reading in the Old Testament, uh, reading through the Bible chronologically. And it's a story of Elisha. And Elisha was an incredibly godly man with, that had seen many miracles in his life. And he got involved in uh, helping preserve his kingdom for a while. So the king that was in Samaria, which was the northern kingdom's capital, and the king of Syria they were at war or they, they didn't really have like a full-scale warfare. The, the people from Syria would come down and would raid towns and, and uh, capture towns. And so Elisha got a word from the Lord and he began spend, sending notes to the, the king saying, hey, watch out here, there's going to be an ambush or why don't you put your troops here because that's where they're going to attack. And he was incredibly flawless in getting it right every time. And so finally, the king of Syria says to, he pulls all his commanders in there and he says, okay, one of you is a spy, one of you is a mole. Who's telling the king of Israel where we are going to be? And uh, one of the commanders piped up and said, it's not us, sir. Uh, Elisha, the prophet of God, can tell the king what you're saying in your bedroom because the spirit of God is in him. And so that's his reputation and, and that's the backstory. And so what the king of Syria did is he said, let's go kill that guy. And they found out he was living in a little town called Dothan. And so they said, okay, send the troops over there. We're going to kill that guy, take care of the problem. Then we can begin to have military victory again. And so that's the scenario that comes out. 
And here we are in 2 Kings chapter 6. Uh, open your Bibles or open your Bible app. And it says in verse 15, When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. So he's opening the curtains, getting ready for the day, and he looks out there and he sees chariots and horsemen and you know tents, and they're all encamped around. They are serious and they are about to destroy his master and probably the whole city. And so his response is, oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? Now, I don't know if you can imagine being in that setting. If we're in a town and all of a sudden the tanks roll up and the, the mortars and there's soldiers by the thousands around us and you realize they're coming to kill us. I think you'd panic as well. I think I would as well. And, and so he panics here. And, and isn't it interesting when we feel fearful, we, we are distressed and we grab for control. He says, oh no, my Lord. I don't think he just said, hey, this is a problem. He's panicking, freaking out. And, and then he says, what shall we do? Well, honestly, the answer was, they, well, there was nothing they could do. I mean, unless you try to dig a deep hole and hide. So when fear overwhelms us, we have a tendency to panic. And, and we look at our own power, even though it's very limited, and we try to take control. And he goes into Elisha and he says this, and here's Elisha's response. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And, and I don't know how you read that, but that sounds like he is calm, like he is not afraid, he is not worried. And then he gives this, this line, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, Elisha had served under the great prophet Elijah. And when Elijah was taken up to heaven, Elisha had asked for a double portion of his spirit. And Elisha had seen God do miracle after miracle after miracle. And the, the history of his faith in God brought him to a place of peace and calmness in the middle of the crisis. And he says, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. <laughs> now, I think if we were to look at it, the servant is being a realist. He's seeing an enemy that's there. He's saying, you know what, this is a big problem. And, and Elijah, Elisha says, don't be afraid. And I think he must have been thinking, what are you thinking about? Why wouldn't we be afraid? This is a serious situation. And often we see realistically, but we don't see spiritually. And Elisha said, there's a different picture than you're seeing, son. There is a deeper reality here. And so Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he might see. He doesn't say, Lord, protect us. He doesn't pray for help. He doesn't pray for God to send in troops. He just says, God's got this. And, and I wish my servant could see it. I wish, I wish he could see the world the way that I see it. I wish that he could see the world, God, the way that you see it. And so there's this cool verse where he says, the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha that literally he had a change of view and he could see the invisible world, the angels that were controlling and, and protecting Elisha. And those that surrounded Elisha were themselves surrounded. And Elisha's like, God's got this. Don't even worry about it. Don't even spend your, your time worrying about what could happen. And I think this is empower, an important principle that, that power comes when you change the way of seeing which causes you to change your way of responding, which then changes the world. You see, the, the servant was seeing the physical danger and panicking, and his, his part was to, to feel fear and to, to panic and to try to take control. And, and because of that, he was living in a perpetually stressed out world. And maybe that's you. Uh, as we look around us, there's all kinds of reasons for fear and dismay. And you, you can say, it looks like the, the governments and the culture and the, the people and even maybe people I know have, have walked into violence and greed and anger and immorality and it just, it just feels like realistically God is losing. And yet, spiritually, Elijah, Elisha said, God help him to see your power and your purpose here. That the chariots 
around us to, su to support and protect us are greater than the chariots that are coming to kill us. God was surrounding them and Elisha was living in the peace of that, even though there was a tremendous amount of threat. And so the, the beginning of our understanding of the power of God is when we say, God, would you give me open eyes? That we begin to see the world the way God sees it. In fact, I think the, the truth is the servant was seeing things realistically but the spiritual world that Elisha was seeing is a deeper reality. That you and I have a great tendency to see things in terms of our control and our ability to, to see others' control. And, and we like to, to have a, a way to plan it all out and have it be within our understanding. And that's not the plan of God. You know, there are so many ways in which God's plans are higher than our plans, like like the heavens are higher than the earth, and that we can't understand it. And so we need to come and say, Lord, it looks like you are losing and that the church is failing and everything is going south, but I trust you. Elisha said to his servant, don't be afraid because God is at work, because God is unstoppable. So the, the spiritual world that Elisha sees is more real than the physical world that his servant saw. And you and I live in the Shadowlands, C.S. Lewis said. We, we only see the reflection of reality. We, we don't really see reality. We see flesh and blood, and we see powers and authorities of humans, but we don't see the power of God and the, the rank upon rank upon rank of angels. So if we're going to open our eyes, we need to see the spiritual world and then we also need to see from this story that God's heart is about saving people. Sometimes we think that's a New Testament concept, but I love the rest of this story. They, they go out and Elisha prays that God would strike the enemies blind. And they're struck blind. And so then he goes out and he says, well, you don't have quite the right town. Let me tell you where to go. And he leads them down the road a few miles to the capital city of Samaria. He brings them inside the walled city and there they are surrounded by all of the soldiers of the, of the Israeli army. And then he says, God, would you please open their eyes again? You know, it's a fascinating thing. He says, God, open my servant's spiritual eyes. And then he asks to close the physical eyes. And then he asks to open the physical eyes. And God listens to his requests. And all of a sudden, these soldiers who were planning on killing Elisha and destroying a town, they are now absolutely powerless. And so the king of Israel says, should I kill them, my father? And Elisha says, do not kill them. Would you kill those you've captured with your own sword and bow? Set food and water before them so they can eat and drink and then go back to their master. <laughs> so they came to kill. They ended up being invited to a potluck, had a big feast, and then he sent them home. And it says, and the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. And I think that you see in the Old Testament so many places the mercy of God, the grace of God, the, the desire for him to save us and to save them. So first, first part of the power of, of God is that we have to say, God, help me to see things differently. Help me to see the world through your eyes. That will make me unstoppable. And the truth is, is we need the same kind of problem that my Toyota had if we are left on our own, the power drains out. The power does not come from us. But that we need stirred up again. We need influenced and connected in our relationship with Christ so that we don't just see special miracles where, you know, I'd like to see God strike people blind when I pray for that. But the reality is, is that every day that I'm walking in peace in the midst of chaos is a miracle. Every family that stays together and grows in love is a miracle. Every church that moves ahead in spite of all the opinions and difficulties of working with people is a miracle. I think that God's doing miracles around us all the time and we're only aware of them occasionally. So we need our eyes to be opened and the power of God is focused to us in this day and age through the gospel. Romans 1.16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news about Jesus, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. 
So the power of God is released in our lives and in our world through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what is the gospel? It means understanding the life of Jesus and the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus and how that not only impacts us at the moment where we trust him for salvation, but how it impacts us every day of our lives. And so part of the way that God opens our eyes is that he gives us gospel eyes. And what I mean is that we see the world through the lens of the four parts of the gospel. And the four parts of the gospel, important to know all of them is, first of all, that we were created by a loving God with a purpose of having a relationship with him and with, the, with each other. We have a purpose in our world that God wants the beauty of, of harmony and connection with him and with each other. And then in fact, God created us for that reason, that the, that the beginning of the story is beauty and purpose and order and creation, which explains why there is good in our world. You know, I get asked occasionally, why, why can we believe in a God when there's so much evil in the world? And, and I often try to turn that question around and say, how can you believe in an evil world when there's so much good in the world? When, when there's people that, that jump in to save somebody, when there are people that run towards danger to help others, when people who give up selflessly for others, you see, the, the reason there is good in the world is because God created us originally as his connection and his people. And then the second part of the gospel is that the fall, that not only did Adam and Eve sin, but that you and I have chosen sinful, terrible things, and that in fact, in us is a sin nature that chooses selfishness and bitterness, and, and all of those things are constant temptations. That explains why we live in a world of greed and war and violence. That's why, that's why evil is here. And then the third part is the salvation, which is the essence of the Jesus story, that Jesus came and gave his life for us. It, it's simply John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That Jesus came and he became our substitute and laid down his life so that we might have a relationship with God, so that we might be forgiven, so that we might have life forever. And the last part of the gospel is that someday in the future, God will restore all things. There's a day coming when God will triumph and the ultimate picture of the beauty of creation will be restored in the new creation. And that eternal life is something we experience limitedly with God now and someday we will be face to face and we will see and know as we are fully known. And so those four parts, the creation, the fall, the, the redemption of Jesus and the new creation, that's how we need to see the world if we're going to see the power of God in our lives. So let me explain that a little bit. Rivers have always had a huge flow of water in the drought, maybe less so, but that power has always been there. And then thousands of years ago, somebody got the bright idea of putting a water wheel in there so that you could take the power of the water flowing by and turn it into a circular motion. And first of all, it powered mills so people didn't have to grind huge stones around by their own power. They could do it with the power of the river. And, and it then began to, to power all kinds of things. And then if you are interested in it today, I find this fascinating. There's all kinds of modern, what they call micro-hydro projects. And people that have little streams running on their property can somehow take a little bit of that water and, and get it a certain kind of Pelton wheel that's set up in a, in a housing and it begins to turn that and they can hook it up to a generator and it can begin to charge the batteries and, and some of them live off grid completely and some of them just augment their power. But I think this is an important picture for you and I to get. The power of the river was already there. But only when you insert the water wheel into it, only when you take and use that power, does it become actually operational in your life. The power of God is available to every one of us. God desires not only to save us and fill us, but to use us to accomplish his mission. And the question is, do you have your water wheel set up? So are you taking the energy and the power of God and is it beginning to turn and to change things in your life so that you are an impact to others? 
So think about what does that mean, first of all. If I understand the gospel, first, I need to apply it to myself. First part of it, it comes out in Romans 15, 13. He says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It reminds me of Elisha, doesn't it? He was in the middle of chaos, people trying to kill him, an an army around him. And he was living in joy and peace. Why? Because the God of hope had filled him by his spirit with joy and peace. And therefore, he could overflow. I think we make a mistake sometimes when we try to tell other people about the good news of Jesus and we haven't really understood it ourselves or we're not living in that power. So what does it mean as we look at the four parts of the gospel? How does that break down to change my perception of my life? So we need gospel eyes for myself. And then we've talked about this fairly recently. It means that I'm designed for love, that God has created me to be loved by him and to love him back and to love others, that that's my most natural, deepest self. That's how I'm designed. And then I have a battle with sin, that when we trust Christ and confess our sins, we are absolutely forgiven from the penalty of sin. But we are struggling still with the power of sin. And there is a corrupted world around us and there is a, an old nature inside of us. And so we are constantly on a battle. All day long, things come to our mind that are leading us in a wrong direction. So that's the reality of my life. I need the power of Jesus to fight the battle, because the third part of it is that I need daily rescue. I don't pray once and say, Jesus, come into my life, and then for the rest of the time, I'm fine. No, I need that recharging so my batteries don't go dead, because I have no power in myself. And it's only as I spend time coming to Christ. And and frankly, if I don't feel loved by God, I will lose out on his power. And if I am not honest about sin, sin will take the power of God out of our lives. If I don't come daily and ask Christ to not only forgive and empower me, but if he will give me the the words to say and the life to live. And then lastly, my hope is set on the future. And it's so easy for us to have other salvation stories, other gospels. We think I'm a terrible person, but I got to work really hard. And if I get enough finances and enough friends, then I'll be good. You see, people are telling themselves false gospel stories, but ultimately the future is only secure when we have a connection and relationship with Christ. Why can we have hope? Because the God of all hope is filling us by his spirit. So I need to see myself through gospel eyes. That is where the power comes from in me. But the gospel we believe in is not a selfish gospel. It's not all about how to make me feel more secure and give me warm fuzzies. Is it about filling me with power to accomplish the mission of God so that God can do something through me? So what do I need to do? I need to have gospel eyes on how I see other people. And that is contrary to the way that I tend to see people. So just recently, some friends and I got to go to a trip, wonderful trip to Alaska to go fishing. And we were staying with a group of people in a lodge. And, and, and there was a couple of conversations the first night where there were some openings to talk about spiritual things. And I realized I didn't step in and take those opportunities. And as I thought about it, it was because, well, I'll probably never see these people again. This isn't a long-term connection that I, I should pray about and care for. And secondly, I'm on vacation. And you know the... The Lord woke me up way early in the morning. I mean, we were already getting up at three and leaving to four to go fishing, so he woke me up at two. And there was this gentle, quiet conviction of the Spirit that said, why didn't you step into that conversation? Are you a follower of Jesus because you're a vocational pastor, or is that ultimately who I really am? Like, Oh, man, I'm a follower of Jesus whether I'm a pastor in a vocational setting or not. And why didn't I lean into that? And so the Lord convicted me that the way I was seeing people was, do they affect my future? I'm on vacation. Um, Do I think it's going to do any good? All kinds of ways. 
And then the next day, I got to have a spiritual conversation with that same woman. And, and then before the end of the week, I got to have another spiritual conversation with a young 20-year-old. Because my eyes were opened and the power of God opened my eyes to see what he was trying to do so I could step in and participate. When we look at people, we have a tendency to quickly judge people by what they wear and what they do and, and how prosperous they are. And if you see people in this room, it's like, man, that looks like success. Their, their lives are fine. They don't really need Jesus. They, they're doing okay. Why would I tell them about the Lord? And maybe when you look at people, you see them based on whether they're of a certain ethnicity or a certain height or a certain hobby. They, basically, you're asking, do they, are they going to like me and are they like me? Instead of saying, how does God see them? And then I think of some Examples that Pastor Craig talked to us about a couple weeks ago. How do you see people who are in terrible circumstances and, and maybe they've been discarded by society and we would think judgmentally, well, it's their fault. And I'm challenging you to say, is that gospel eyes? Is that how God sees those people? So let's talk about how does our gospel eyes, how does that affect how we see others? Well, first of all, people are valuable whether they're on the CEO list or whether they're in the gutter. People are valuable because they're created by God. Do you see people as valuable inherently or do you see them mostly as bothers or, or how can you use them or how they're an advantage or disadvantage to you? And then secondly, we need to realize that the gospel says all have sinned. Everybody is caught in sin. From the uber successful to the people who are deeply addicted. And sometimes when people are evil or wrong, or especially if they hurt me, it's easy to begin to think of them as the enemy. And you know, a phrase that helped me so much years ago, and the Lord keeps bringing back to mind, to my mind, is that person is not your enemy. They are the victims of the enemy. They've been caught in a trap. They've been caught in bitterness. They've been caught somewhere And not only are they caught, but the third part is that Jesus can always rescue, and he's the only one that can rescue. You know, I I think early in ministry, I tried to rescue people myself, and, and I can't do it. I can't even talk people into being nice for very long. But God can rescue people. And you know, there's nobody beyond his hope, beyond God's hope. There's a lot of people beyond my understanding of hope. But there's nobody beyond God's hope. And then... The last one is that God will prevail. Ultimately, we are on the winning team, not because we are great, but because God is great. And it doesn't matter how successful people look, how obedient their children are, how together their marriage seems. Ultimately, if they end their life without Jesus, they're going to be in hell. That the eternal view is the only view that ultimately matters. And I forget that. I, I see people temporarily. I see people as they, how they treat me. I see people as how I feel about them. Let me give you another example. Several years ago, there was a, a guy that was coming to our church, and he was a missionary. And, and he was a little awkward with people, but, but he was there, and he faithfully attended church. But after a few weeks, he started getting critical of my sermons and of what I said and how we did things as a church. And in almost every conversation after that was a phone call or an email that was, why did you say this? And I don't agree with that. And you shouldn't do Christmas that way. And, and why is there a Christmas tree in the church? And all kinds of individual things. And, and that all came to a head. Well, let me say what is happening in me is I tried to be polite and civil to him. But truthfully, I just started avoiding him. Because in my mind, what I could see is that guy's a problem. Why is he still here? Why, if he doesn't like it, why did he stay? And then one day, I, I was actually preaching on just before Easter. We were talking about Palm Sunday, and I talked about Jesus riding in on the donkey. And I made a humorous comment, well, you are what you drive, you know. And that was seen by everyone as ironic, and yeah, I'm not saying that's the truth. And he calls me up that week, and he says, I can't believe that you talked about Jesus like he's being a donkey. 
And I said, what, what did you mean? He said, well, you said you are what you drive, and that's not true. <laughs> I was totally caught off guard. It was like, are you kidding me? Um, I, I said, that was humor. That was a joke. I, I don't believe you are what you drive. And, and in fact, I explained that Jesus was coming in as a king on a donkey. That was actually a significant thing he was writing. And he was like, oh, well, I, I never have gotten any humor. I, I don't understand jokes. All of a sudden, my viewpoint changed. <clears throat> I had been seeing him as a tormentor, as a problem, maybe even an enemy. And the reality is, I, I believe that he, he is somewhere on the autism spectrum and that, in fact, his awkwardness was, with people is understandable. And, and he literally not just doesn't get humor, he cannot get humor. And all of a sudden, when I saw him as God sees him, my, my heart changed, my response changed, my attitude toward him changed. And I think as we talk about the power of God, God's power is as available to you and I as it ever has been to anywhere in biblical history. And it's only as we pray, God, open my eyes. And as we put our, our propeller, our, our wheel into the flow of God's spirit, that we begin to see things differently. And when we see him differently, we, we feel different and respond differently. And then the world begins to change and God's unstoppable church moves forward. And so I want to challenge you to begin to let God open your eyes where they're closed. Begin to see yourself through the lens of the gospel. Begin to see other people through the lens of the gospel. And say, God, I want to be part of your unstoppable force to accomplish your mission in the world. I'm going to release to each of the campuses, including the online campus, and I want you just to share, as you, as you walk together through this ending, what it is that God needs to open your eyes about. So God bless. Thank you.